but maybe we can actually set a bit the context, get to know you a bit better. I mean, we heard so much uh, from Marina what you have done in, in the past. Um, maybe we can start um, how you actually made your way into the startup and venture capital world and what got you so excited about it. Ben, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So I, I started life as a lawyer and I, I lasted about a, a year <laughs> and then I just found a little bit, a little dry. Um, and then became an investment banker just as the internet was getting going in the US and I spent about sort of uh, about 15 years doing investment banking and I just worked with a, a whole load of entrepreneurs helping them either raise money or find big exits in the US. And, and that was just a tremendous experience. I got to meet lots of really great founders, great companies being developed. But after sort of 15 years of investment banking, you kind of figure that's enough for a lifetime. And I really wanted to get involved in the, the, the beginning of the life cycle of the companies. And so I started work as an early stage investor and um, doing you know, seed and A round investing, pretty much what the guys at Early Bird do today. And uh, that's what got me into being an investor. Mm -hmm. And I started with some ex-clients ex who were clients of mine in the banking world. We then became, uh, client, uh, became my partners and we built a couple of funds. And that's where I am today. What do you think actually shaped you uh, from your experience with being an investment banker? What have you learned that you can now apply in your role as, a, as an investor? I think the one thing you learn as an investment banker is, is you learn how to manage your portfolio. The, the, the trick with investing in early stage companies is that you know, most companies ultimately won't make it. You're looking for the star, the one in ten that's going to make the difference. And I think when you're, you know, when you're an advisor, you have a... You have a the benefit of seeing a lot of different opportunities, mm -hmm. and and hopefully as a result of that, you form a judgment as to you know, which is the one that's going to fly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think it gives you a good portfolio skill. Mm -hmm. What would you actually say excites you most now? Investing in, in startups, being in the investing world. I just like I mean I think Europe is just like a hugely exciting place to be right now. I, I mean the the ecosystem. I mean even here in Berlin in Germany, the ecosystem has come alive. Mm -hmm in the last five years. I mean, so I don't think, it, I don't, I don't think there's been a more exciting time to invest in tech. And when you see great companies like, you know, in Fabian's portfolio, UiPath, companies you know, become global leading businesses in just a few years. That's just so exciting. Yeah. Uh, it's a great time to be investing. Yeah. Fabian, you also started quite early your entrepreneurial journey, right? And maybe you can, you can take us a bit on your path and what, you, what got you excited and when did you actually decide for the career as a founder? So, <clears throat> growing up in a, in a small town near Hanover in, in the western parts of Germany, my brother and I actually already started our first business when uh, he was 14, I was 18. We were basically still in high school and, uh, and we also, our, our parents not being entrepreneurs, um, we always had this kind of intrinsic um, drive to look for opportunities and basically take the, the little money that, uh, that we had back in the days. And, uh, and we invested all of that um, back in the year 2000 into what, what you would uh, today call a food truck business for, for coffee and, and French pastries. And um, this was essentially the, the kick of our, our, our entrepreneurial career. Um, however, we did not have the guts back in the days to pursue that career full time. Um, also, as in those years, it was um, anything but mainstream to want to become to an entrepreneur. Um, unless you had to take a family business um, to, to take it to the next generation, which we did not have. So he went to business school, I went to law school, I'm also um, a trained lawyer, however, I, I didn't even make it to the second bar exam. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I, was, uh, I was lucky, um, because I had the chance um, back in 2005 for the first time to spend six months focusing on IP, IT law and going to Silicon Valley, back in the day Santa Clara. And then in 2008, I was a visiting um, PhD student for corporate law in Stanford. And, um, and those, um, and spending time in Silicon Valley um, and, and in a period where in, in, in Germany and Europe, tech IPO window was closed and venture capital landscape was just, you know, it was the nuclear winter after the 2001 bubble burst. Um, that was essentially where my entrepreneurial interest intersected with technology. And from basically after that, the, that those uh, couple of months in Stanford, it was clear to me that this is what I want to do in life. 
And, um, and shortly thereafter, my brother and I started um, founding businesses, um, first in Hamburg and then um, moved to Berlin. And after three failures, um, ultimately then with, with um, a B2C marketplace, a local couponing company, Daily Deal, we had a first larger success, you could say. But at the same time, that was also the last company which, uh, which we had started as co-founders that were running together. Because so after that, uh, Trace to Google, we actually split up and I switched onto the investors. Mm -hmm. And because you mentioned like the entrepreneurial the skills that you need, the guts somehow that you, you gotta have, what would you say, uh, or from, speaking from your experience, the skills that you need as an entrepreneur? Because I know that you are uh, used to be a surfer, or you're still surfing. I also know Ben is like actively <laughs> motor racing, uh, and I think there are some parallels. Obviously, you have to you have to you have to be a fun guy. Uh, you have to take risks. Um, so, what do you what do you think um, like in terms of the, the skills that you need to have as a person to, to become a founder? Um, yeah, you could talk for hours about it. <laughs> But um, but to, to make it to to boil it down, what 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 do I look today as an investor? What um, what do I look for? It's essentially a three core criteria which I like to see in in the CEO and the founders team of the companies we we invest in. And that's essentially um, the right mix of analytical intelligence. So say intelligence. Um, it's energy because um, experience shows. And it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Typically, you know, when you look into our portfolio, the, the star performing companies, it takes seven, eight, sometimes ten years until they actually mature. Yeah? And, um, and, and, and people need to have that stamina to go all the way. It's not about a year or two. Yeah? There are some lucky shots and early exits, but typically it's a really long term commitment. So, intelligence, energy, and integrity. Because yes, if the integrity is missing, um, and that's what you see in Lehman Crisis, etc. Um, if integrity is missing, all energy and all intelligence doesn't take you too far. Yeah. Ben, do you want to add anything? Well, I think of one of your surfing and motor racing uh, <laughs> comments. So on, on surfing, surfing is all about getting the right wave at the right time. Right? Yeah, I think so, much of, as well, then, yeah. so much of this business is about just getting your timing right. Yeah. And, and that's a lot of just knowing your space, knowing your market, and it's a good bit of luck as well, right? But, so getting the right timing. I think motor racing is all about doing small things very well. It's about little, little small improvements. Um, if you watch you know, Vettel and Hamilton fight it out, it's about the tiny little things they do. And hundreds and hundreds of those tiny things make for the bigger picture. But if you don't do the tiny things right, you'll never get the big picture. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I, like, I like the analogy. Um, Fabio, maybe you can also talk a bit more about your early days uh, as, an, as an investor. Yeah, so, um, so as I said, we, we kind of emerged in this kind of brother almost, even though we're not twins, but kind of twin-like relationship. Like look alike. Look, 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 look <laughs> <bit> alike. <laughs> um, so we came to that point, basically, where um, it was clear for my brother that, you know, he's the younger brother and the older brother, he, he, he wanted to take ultimate responsibility. Um, and this is basically why we said, okay, let's diversify. And, um, and um, and keep funding operational companies, and then after a daily deal, we started another four, essentially. So we keep funding operational um, companies, and the company whose CEO my brother today is is called FreightHub.com. It's basically a digital uh, freight forwarding businesses for ocean and air freight. Um, you could say the kind of the DHL of the 21st century, or the DHL in the cloud. B2B business, 100, 100 people that raised the 20 million Series A last uh, December. I'd say it's probably fair to say they are one of the big logistics technology showcases in Europe at the moment. Um, so, so, so we kept doing that, and, and he's clearly since 2000, he's the CEO. And I diverted um, and said, let me, um, let me basically try to take the experience which we gained in, with all the failures, but also with some of the successes that we had. Let me try to basically. Um, you know, give this experience in a very hands-on investment style. Um, first of all, an angel at seed stage, that's what I did for the first four years, um, before then becoming a partner at Early Bird and, and starting to focus on Series A. Um, let me, let me uh, try to pass on this experience in a very hands-on style um, to other early stage founders. And, uh, and for me, um, today, when I compare the CEO role, or co-founder CEO role in an operational business, with the role um, as an investment professional or partner in a, in a VC firm, 
for me personally, but that's actually a very personal thing. And depending on your character traits and what and, you know what, what you're excited about, for me, I like much more the the thought about working with five, six, seven, eight portfolio companies with um, for whom I'm for which I'm responsible, and trying to identify patterns and trying to transfer best practice between these companies, um, rather than. Um, Diving super deep on one company 24/7, what essentially the CEO job is about to some extent, and and, and so um, I think it's fair to say that in the setting that, that we found today, both my brother and I are doing each what we're better at. Okay, perfect. Um, now being involved with Early Bird and Ben you with Draper Esprit, maybe you can talk a bit also about the investment focus that the companies have, what you're looking at these days. Mm -hmm and some of the niche markets that excite you at the most? Well, I, 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 mean, I guess you know, the, the, the complementarity is we're both excited by very much the same themes, right? So if you look at what the Draper's B team is looking at and what the Early Bird team is looking at, it's really, yeah. you know, it's, it goes through uh, blockchain, it goes through IoT, it goes through autonomous vehicle technology, um, you know, it's a real close fit, right? FinTech, Fintech yeah. exactly. So I, I think, uh, and I'm not sure those themes are particularly new or unusual, right? I, I just think that those are the... What's interesting about tech is it's affecting almost every industry yeah. worldwide, right? Taxi hailing, banking, every big industry is being disrupted by tech, and that's the exciting yeah. bit. Um, but what were, for example, some, some good examples that you have observed over the last years that really surprised you? Um, I'm amazed, actually. I think retail banking is really interesting because, you know, who would have thought that within a few years, um, the big banks, the, the, the RBS in the UK, the Lloyds Bank, the Santander's, would be under such massive threat by, by newcomers, by challengers, people who weren't even here yeah. five, six, seven years ago. I mean, that is, that is, that is a huge change shift. And it's because uh, of the speed that you're taking. Well, uh, partly it's just because of you know, what happened in the Lehman crisis in 2008 is the banks stopped spending money on technology. Mm -hmm. Um, they did no product innovation whatsoever for four or five years, and guess what? Revolut comes along, N26 comes along, and they basically eat their lunch, and, and that's it. That's what it, what's exciting about investing in, in these businesses. Mm -hmm. And maybe also observing another niche, because you mentioned so many that you're looking at. Uh, I mean, Freiburg is also big innovation, but like share some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, as Ben mentioned, um, essentially, you know, our strategy, and that's pretty much true for, for, for both firms, um, and that's also the reason why um, a corporation makes a lot of sense, but let's get to that later. Um, our, our investment strategy is essentially, if you think of it as a kind of multi-dimensional cube, it's focused on Europe um, from a geographical perspective. I'm talking about early bird only. It's focused on seed and series A from a stage perspective, and then we essentially um, have a set of about a handful of industry slash technology focus areas, for each of which um, we have a practice group in our team consisting typically of two people, one partner, one investment professional, who build really deep domain expertise. And that can result from their previous operational roles. So for example, our principal Tim, who's been on the jury here, he was a co-founder CEO of a blockchain company before. So clearly now, you know, being six years into the industry, being one of the early miners, Bitcoin miners here in Berlin, he, he's somebody who's very recognized in that industry. So it makes a lot of sense for him to be to also invest in that area, which he knows particularly well. Um, and, um, and, and and all those practice groups basically thrive to really deeply understand uh, these spaces: banking, fintech, intro tech, fintech, enterprise blockchain, enterprise software as a service, mobility, blockchain, uh, logistics technology, supply chain. To, to name the most important ones, yeah. uh, to, to get a really deep understanding of those areas and also be able to benchmark the investment opportunities that we see from, from those areas against each other on a European uh, perspective, but even go further and um, also upstream into the in, in, in common player landscape, because for many of um, the companies we're backing, it's also important to have access for business development, strategic partnerships, etc. Ultimately, also at some point, M and A, uh, to have access to the to the top level decision makers in the S and P five hundred or Eurostox fifty companies. And this is basically what we all bring together. And um, and this is also um, our approach to uh, to getting it right um, uh, in terms of portfolio construction. Because we, um, uh, we cannot bet the whole fund on one vertical, not knowing when in four to six to eight years we need to divest our investments 
and our investors um, expecting 15 plus percent um, um, returns net IRR each year. We, we, it's really hard to to um, to forecast what the exit multiples in a particular one of those five or ten other verticals will be in four, six, eight years. So we need to make these uncorrelated bets and not put all eggs in one basket on the one hand side but on the other hand side we believe in having this domain expertise building in the team and not being an agnostic momentum investor that simply invests in companies which are growing fastly without profoundly understanding what are the underlying drivers in that particular industry um, maybe we can also now deep dive into the whole investment logic um, could you guys maybe elaborate a bit more about the differences between the early stage and the later growth stage uh, investment phase? I think, I think early stage, you're kind of backing uh, a great team focused on a big market opportunity. I mean, that's really, and probably that's all you have to go on, right? I mean, there's no, there's no revenue, uh, hopefully there's some IP, um, but it's really a team focused on a big market where you think they can disrupt, right? Um, that's very tricky to do. <laughs> Arguably, I have the easier job because as you're investing slightly later, <laughs> you've got some revenue, hopefully, you've got some proof of concept, you've got a go-to-market strategy, uh, you've, got, you've got more data points to, to, to look at. Right? Um, so it does change. We're kind of both investing, at, you know, but the point I think you made earlier was it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. These companies take a long time to build um, to become the, you know, the successful exits. It takes time. What would you actually say, because we had the, uh, the startup pitches earlier and they are now expanding to new markets, what would you as an investor recommend to these founders what to focus on on the next step and then making the move to new markets? Well, I actually just came in from Hamburg, so I haven't seen those pitches, but um, <clears throat> generally, um, Quite often we see we see companies um, not only scaling but also internationalizing prematurely, and that can um, that can even kill a business that has a viable um, and substantial core. So um, so generally, when you think from um, basically from taking your seat or using your seat round money in order to to deliver a really sustainable proof of concept in a certain geographical um, market in a certain subsector targeting certain customers but showing for those customers good unit economics and that you can retain them and that you your product is really 10x better than the way they have solved the problem you are addressing to date yeah? um, and that is really what you want to use your seed money for and then use your series A to start scaling and expanding but do it really incrementally and, and, um, and again do not risk the, the core by wanting too much too, too quick. So ma many businesses also, later stage businesses, have failed because they did not get that right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really about dominating one niche and then starting from there basically thinking in concentric circles rather than trying to do land grabs and putting your flag here, here and there and then ultimately the cash burn explodes, your unit economics yeah. are bad and, and show is over. I think that's also a very good example with N26. I mean, they have dominated the, the German or the European market and are now expanding to the US as far as I know, right? Yes, um, that, that's correct. Um, so, I mean, they do have competition in Europe, but I think it's fair to say that their product, and also when you look on the, kind of under the hood, the, the metrics that this business shows um, are probably best in class in Europe. And for them, um, it's now kind of, if they make it in the US, they are a global player. And this is the ambition. It's, it's not, it's not um, safe that this is going to work out, but they have such a strong home base in Europe now that even if they do not succeed in the US, there was still going to be a billion dollar business um, in, in Europe standard. Yeah. Um, we already just touched on the, on the metrics. I mean, when you're looking at the early stage, most importantly is the, the founding team, but maybe you can also highlight some other key metrics that you are looking at at the later stage um, when, this, when you see like the traction of the startup is, is growing. Uh, I mean, actually, even at the early, just at the early stage, because I mean that's really relevant to your audience here. You know, I mean ultimately, I think the market judges uh, the success of companies by profitability, right? So that's a long way away. <laughs> Re <laughs> revenue, but then I mean when I look at it, I look at the ability of the entrepreneur to 
to attract great people around him. That's that or her. That could be great um, uh, founders, co-founders. It could be great employees. It could be great investors and advisors. So in a sense, you know, can the can the founder be a magnet for great talent? That's a great proof point, I think. And then beyond that is then, well, can they find some customers? Can they find some people who do a proof of concept? Can they keep those proof of concepts? Can they turn them into into paying business? So that there are actually many. You think about it, there are many steps along the way that you can judge somebody by a company by or somebody by, yeah. and, and it, 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 some of them are much softer than just revenue or ARR or whatever. I mean, there's so many other financial metrics, right? Sure. But the other, the other, the softer metrics are usually the more interesting ones. Sure. Yeah, especially at the, at the early stage. Yeah. Um, once you are invested in a, in a startup. How do you actually work with the founding teams? I mean, it also depends whether you have a board seat or not. But like, how does this, for example, hands-on approach actually looks like in, in practice? Yeah. So, um, so part of our strategy, which, which I can basically um, you know, add as comments to what I said before, is that we are also always typically leading or co-leading the the rounds in which we're investing, be it seed, be it a Series A. That means uh, we are essentially the, the investor at the table who's um, negotiating the terms, um, who's running the whole due diligence, um, who's also uh, negotiating the long form, and who's um, typically always present on the board of the company. Um, and uh, we do not um, do that as uh, basically as one man shows, but we always for each deal, and, uh, for each deal, each investment. I mean, for each investment, um, we basically assemble a tag team from within our investment um, teams, there's always one partner and one non-partner who together manage that portfolio company. So there's some redundancy. And um, so the, the, the work on the typically um, once a quarter board meetings, that's just kind of the peak of the iceberg. Yeah. Where you actually um, get together with the other investors um, um, and typically discuss management reportings, strategic decisions uh, and the likes. But, um, but for us, um, a lot of the value that we are able to provide goes way beyond these board meetings and, and basically is derived from workshops that we, uh, that we hold with the companies on a basically on an as-needed uh, basis. And that can cover basically all functions, so from business development over recruiting, we're kind of constantly um, supporting recruiting, anything from mid to top management um, level. Um, Follow-on financings, we are basically the ones opening the doors to US investors later stage, to, um, to Chinese and, and Asian investors, bringing them at the right time um, at the table for Series B, Series C leadership. Um, um, it, uh, it can cover um, anything uh, related to sales, ops, AI, product, etc. We also host regular meetups for CXOs. So once a year we put 20 chief marketing officers in our office to exchange best practice, have some speakers who are at the cutting edge um, of a relevant topic for this year. So we try to basically facilitate exchange, um, let best practice kind of um, flow, flow um, within the portfolio um, and, and, uh, and enable each company to not only learn from other best-in-class um, examples from within the portfolio, but also learn from the experience from our investment team members. Um, this is essentially how we define hands-on portfolio support. That sounds very good, actually. I mean, that the startups, uh, they can learn from each other and help, help each other out and share the experience. Does it also look like a trader or is it somewhat different? I think it's a little different because because we're investing in a later stage. Yeah. We're kind of coming into a pre-existing situation, right? I mean, there's a, the entrepreneur, he's got his team, he's got his uh, group of investors already. And it's kind of very easy to sort of jump in there and uh, mess it all up very quickly, I'd say. So I, I would just say that, you know, I think you... There's, there's usually a, a, what you call an oh shit board meeting at some point in time, which could be the first time, it could be the three or four meetings later, but there's normally a meeting where you kind of now really understand what you've invested in. And I think it's kind of worth waiting until that, that meeting and then working afterwards, right? So uh, I think, you know, look, at the end of the day, um, two of my lessons learned are, you know, I'm an investor, I'm not, in this relationship, I'm the investor, not the entrepreneur. I'm not doing it. I'm supporting you, the entrepreneur, to do it. Yeah. And there's a big difference there, right? Totally, yeah. And then secondly, um, it's a long game. And, and actually, one of the things an investor can do is just bring slightly... It's very easy to get stuck in the weeds. In the, in, in, you know, obviously, doing the small things are very important, but sometimes you actually have to look at the, the bigger long-term picture. Yeah. And that, that's easier to do as an outsider sometimes. 
And now speaking about long-term uh, picture and the view, maybe we can now deep dive into the, uh, the strategic partnership that, that it has been announced. Can you give us some background on that partnership, what it is about, what the motivation was? I think that's quite interesting to hear, learn, uh, to hear and learn more about. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, so the relationship on a, a partner or even founding partner level between um, Draper and Early Bird dates back already like 10, 11 years when um, some of both sides' founding partners were sitting together on the board of the European Venture Capital Association. This is kind of how, how they met. We met both firms. Um, and essentially, the, you know, the, the strategic partnership, as we, as we um, announced it now um, uh, a, a couple of months ago, um, you have to see that in the context of the hypothesis uh, both firms share about the evolution of the European venture capital landscape. And, um, and Draper, um, for example, um, is very strong in the, um, in the UK. They have these offices in London, in Oxford, in Dublin. Uh, there's almost, I'd say, close to 100% deal flow coverage um, in the UK, but also to some extent a good presence in France and the Nordics, whereas early bird it's much stronger on the continent um, and also in southern and eastern Europe. Um, so it's quite complementary from a regional perspective. It's also very complementary from a stage perspective because we are focused on seed and A rounds, whereas Draper is focused on B and C rounds. But kind of it, it, it adds it adds basically one to the other. And um, and and looking again at the big picture, as, um, as as Ben just mentioned it for a company perspective, we think that. Um, in five, ten years from now, there will be a set of, say, a handful, a maximum seven, eight, leading European firms um, who will basically have this pan-European coverage and have feet on the ground and relevant network in all of the major five, six, seven European hubs, not only including London, Berlin, but also clearly Stockholm, uh, Paris, um, potentially also Tel Aviv, let's see. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, 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 and those firms, we envisage will also be able to follow the entrepreneur's life cycle with his company um, throughout many stages. So basically being able to write a, a seat check size, but also being able to deploy these 20, 30, 40, 50 million tickets in later stage, growth stage, maybe all the way to pre-IPO. So, um, so basically, um, we think uh, that what used to be a very fragmented landscape, all these kind of local players, local champions in their ecosystems that do only seed or that do only series A, etc. We think this is, um, this is um, going to kind of amalgamize and there will be a few firms um, on top of the ladder who will basically extract 80-90% of the value from European venture because the distribution of returns, of investor returns, that you can, you can see that very clearly when you look into the US ecosystem, which is much more mature, it's 50, 60 years old, the European ecosystem is only about 20, 25 years old, there's also this kind of golden circle of 10, 12 firms who rate in 90% um, of, um, of the returns. Yeah. This is what we expect. And this is um, why we, this is where we think um, combining these resources um, uh, that, that are mentioned, we have a very good position to um, actually establish ourselves um, at, that, at that sweet spot. How do we actually then assess, because there are many big US VCs that are now coming to Europe, maybe they're running out of investments in the US, but how do you assess that like one of the big, like a couple of big players are now coming to Europe, do you see them as a threat now being this merger, or how would you like assess this? I, I don't, well, look, they've been, the, the Americans have been coming to Europe for like 20 years, right? So, I mean, this is just exactly, you could have said the same thing 10 years ago, right? And the, and the reality is, there's a couple of American funds who've made an impact here, but not many. I mean, Axel, yeah, Index is a European fund that's made an impact in the US, Atomico is European, Boulderton is European. You know, most of the big funds still here in Europe today who are doing deals are mostly Europeans. Right? Okay. However, I don't think you can afford to be complacent. I think the, the challenge for the entrepreneur has been raising enough money to fund your business to be successful internationally. And so if you go back 10 years, you know, the, the, uh, and, I, and I suffered this uh, when I was at Eden Ventures, is that I had a great company, the collaboration software competed with Box and Dropbox and SharePoint, and we raised $10 million, and Box raised $50, 
and box raised four hundred and fifty million dollars, and and you just can't compete head to head with such a difference in capital deployed. Right? There's just no way that if you have seventy seventy million dollars, you can't compete with somebody who's got four hundred fifty million dollars. It just doesn't work. So you have to change strategy, and and you end up being possibly the smaller market player because of that. And I think what Europe needs to do, and this is why we've got together, is we need to be able to support our companies with appropriate capital. And, and that means doing early stage investing very, very well, spotting the winners, and then being able to fund, fund them more later. Um, and it's fascinating, I don't know if you've been watching the news over the last couple of weeks, it's just fascinating to see how the, the, e, uh, the e-micro scooter battle is playing out between Bird and Lime, right, raising you know, hundreds of millions from, you know, Axel, Atomico, Index, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a whole handful of European players, obviously Tia announced uh, this morning, I think from yeah. North Zone, you had, um, you had you, you know, Lucas Gadowski is rumored to be doing 50 million euros into a Berlin-based e-scooter startup. I mean, you, you walk around Paris and you can't help but fall over five or six different brands of scooter startup. But what's interesting, so at least it's not all going to Lime and Bird, yeah. the US players. At least there will be, I believe, there'll be three or four well-funded European players. Uh, and let's see how that competition plays out. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you, are, you already mentioned that, like, besides of the sharing the deal flow and investment resources, a partnership totally makes sense. Could you elaborate even a bit more? So what, what will be the next six months look like? Um, being, being partners. Uh, more drinking at Octoberfest. <laughs> um, oh my god. <laughs> it will be the, the, the blue wine at the Christmas market then. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, six months uh, is actually a bit of a short horizon. Yeah, you <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> yeah, it might be work for you. So, uh, yeah, six months, 12 months, 18 months. So, uh, in any case, you know, uh, what, what we're doing um, for now is we're basically um, sharing the, the, the know how that is in our practice groups, which are very much um, similar. So, we basically put even, even more brain power in understanding these spaces better and also. In, um, in kind of sinking on the bets that we are making, um, in a pan-European bet on the winner approach, if you will, yeah. um, we are making sure that, um, that we are um, getting more access to early stage UK deals. So just, for example, um, just recently, um, a month ago, um, I've been leading the Series A round at a London-based um, legal tech company called Lexu, uh, which also a paper had a look at and could assist us in, in assessing this deal and, and having much more background knowledge on the reputation of the founders team in London, where we do not have an office at the moment. Vice versa, we are making sure that um, the Draper gets access to um, to those deals, which in the past we've mostly been uh, basically pushing um, to US and, um, and Asian money, and and in that respect, you know, we are just looking um, forward um, to being able to to serve European entrepreneurs with more capital from Europe, rather than giving the best of breed of our companies um, away and then giving that value creation um, to foreign investors, it doesn't really make sense also from a macroeconomical and, and, and be, being you know, in a European perspective. Um, just being conscious of time, because I also want to give the, um, the guys in the audience the, the possibility to ask them questions. Um, maybe just one last question. If you could change a thing, or like just going back, I don't know, 10 years, and you know exactly what you know for enough land at, at, at this current stage. What would you actually change in your approach of starting starting to become a, a PC? Um, I would have um, I would have uh, taken a much more focus in terms of industries, technologies, much more focused approach, basically the way we do it uh, today. And I would also have adopted a much more hypothesis-driven approach um, in what we today basically use our deep dives for when we when we put really um, days and no, actually weeks into researching certain sectors um, or technological developments in, in very detail in order to derive for us as a firm 
what are the investment hypotheses that we develop and that we will um, test, probe um, for these sectors. And then also doing that in an outbound approach, mapping the industry, looking, um, looking for who we think will be the winner. Because when I started investing seven years ago, for the first few years, it was very opportunistic. We um, also, of course, we didn't have a holistic um, deals for coverage. So when I started out the first year, I saw 100 deals. Then in the fourth year, we saw 700 deals with a small team. Now at Early Bird, only in Western Europe, we see 5,000 deals. 5,000, out of which we can make five to eight new investments each year. So, so this is quite a large pool to tap into. But essentially, less opportunistic, less erratic, but much more focused, much more hypothesis driven, because this is, I have a much higher chance to create outstanding returns. Ben? Well, actually, I, I would do what I'm actually doing now, which is That's really great. exciting. So, so <laughs> you're doing it right. Yeah, well, uh, you learn, right? And, and so, um, you know, one of my lessons learned about becoming a venture capital investor was like, actually, I joined a group of partners who were really good partners. I mean, they were software engineers, uh, tech skills. They became entrepreneurs. They become seed investors, and then they were investors in a in a fund, right? So, very very similar to Fabiana Fabian's story in many ways, and they were a great combination, a great complement to my skill set. However, they're the same age as me. And, and that's, that's wrong. Venture capital is all about experience gets you so far. The trouble is, the more experience you get, the easier it becomes to say, you know, I saw that 10 years ago, and it didn't work then, so it won't work now. Yeah. And that's the thing that, as you get it more experience, you have to fight hard against that, that, that reaction. So for me, with, with, with Draper Street and with Early Birds, we've got a, a, a team of experienced people, but also a team of very passionate, uh, and ambitious young people, and the chances of them spotting the next hot tech deal is as good, if not better, than me. And, and that, that's the bit I enjoy, uh, building a team like that. Amazing. Okay, guys, um, there's still so many questions unanswered, and, and hopefully you guys will also ask some critical questions, maybe about the strategic partnership. Um, so let's open the floor for some questions from the audience. If you have a question, raise your hand. I think Tom will forward the hopefully functioning microphone. <laughs> yes, it uh, should work now. Perfect. So who has the first question? Over here. So over there. Hello, I actually have a question regarding your expectations about the time of exit when you go with uh, something more further than the first round, like the seed round or something. What are your expectations at the beginning mostly? Because what I, from my experience, uh, investors come and they expect in three to five years they can exit and uh, what basically how it works in your approach. <coughs> Yeah, so um, when I started investing and uh, basically just getting my hands dirty seven years ago, that was my expectation. <laughs> um, now experience shows, and that's also why I'm, uh, I'm really glad to, to work alongside partners who have 20 plus years investment experience and, and really literally hundreds of deals. Um, experience shows that when you come in in seed or series A, you typically um, need to account for seven, eight, nine years of holding period um, until the really big exits happen. Yeah? Um, so I'm talking about the IPOs that we're making. They typically take so long. There are exceptions, so Wunderlist, for example, a portfolio company of ours, we sold after two years to, to Microsoft, so about a year and a 